Morning. 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 Are you welcome? Hold my presentation up. Sure. Great. Oh, so those of you that may not know me, I'm Teresa Dirksen. Uh, I work for the county um, for a group called Ag Solutions. So. Want the flicker? You got one? I can get one. That's all right. I can flip through it this way. This is easy. So just a little background on Ag Solutions, if you're not familiar. Um, it was a group formed in early 2011, a group of farmers farming in Grand Lake St. Mary's watershed who wanted to come together to search for solutions to improve water quality on the ag side of things. Um, they had a volunteer coordinator for those several years until I was hired in early 2016. And they lost steam after about two to three years, but they were very active, did a lot of pilot projects, um, searched for solutions, heard a lot of presentations from different technologies, and then they just, like I said, lost steam. So that's when uh, their volunteer coordinator at that time approached the Mercer County Commissioners about funding a full-time position, and here I am today. Um, there's two main focuses I'm really working on, and that is um, nutrient management, solid liquid separation of manure, and then also looking at how we can reduce phosphorus running off the land. So first I'm gonna focus a little bit on manure nutrient removal, concentration technologies, and potential pilot projects. <coughs> we did a pilot project with a company called Digested Organics back in uh, December. That was uh, very successful. We proved that it works. However, we're still working on a lot of logistic issues, um, cost effectiveness, it's expensive to do a lot of these things. Um, so we're still working with that company and like I said, they've got a really good technology. It's just, we need to keep looking at other things too. So we were approached early this year by a technology called Quick Wash. Um, it's been bought, it was a technology developed by USDA Ag Research Service and it was bought by a company called Renewable Nutrients. And this process is a little bit different than what we traditionally think of. Normally we're removing the solids out of the manure which where the nutrients are attached to. They're basically doing the complete opposite. So they're adding sulfuric acid to the manure and then they're putting it through a dewatering process. So that sulfuric acid takes that phosphorus and actually puts it into the liquid part of that manure. And then we separate those solids out so you're left with an organic byproduct um, that can be easily used on the fields with little to no phosphorus in them. And then the next process, they add lime, which basically takes that phosphorus and precip precipitates it back out. So they're creating a product called calcium phosphate and it comes out as a, a cake type material at about 50% moisture is what we're told. And that product is supposedly very similar to triple superphosphate, which is commercially available on the market. And if that's the case, it would be very easy to market this product, um, which has always been a challenge in any of these technologies. How do you market the phosphorus that you're separating out and make it profitable? So, um, Re Renewable Nutrients is partnered with a company called InNow. It's an Israeli-based company um, in our region. So I've been working with several guys out of Cleveland and they've developed some models for this system. And I've reiterated to them the need for a mobile type system. So one producer doesn't have to make this huge investment themselves. We can have a company, um, you know, a co-op or someone that could come in and provide this as a service. So they would make that investment or we could look for a grant to provide that um, technology. And right now, from what they're telling me, operating costs are at about a penny a gallon to operate the system. Now, if we look at operating plus capital, they're um, a little less than two cents per gallon, but they are working to get that even lower. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what we're gonna be doing in our area to pilot some of this equipment. But this mobile system could process 70 gallons per minute, so that would allow us to do about 10 million gallons a year, which would service 10 dairy farms, maybe 20 swine farms. 
So it's, it's not a lot, and we would need more than one mobile system to be effective, but we've got to start somewhere. So they're currently working on a proposal to do a full pilot project in our area, but within the next few weeks, we're going to be doing a mini type pilot where we're doing that first section where we're adding the sulfuric acid and using the dewatering process. So what they're trying to do is minimize the cost. And that largest portion of that cost is in that dewatering equipment. So they're looking at several different types of technology and figuring out which one's most effective and most cost effective as well. And they're not charging to do this mini pilot, so that's going to be great. And I'm hoping to get it done sometime in April before all of our farmers get super busy uh, planting crops. But then we want to come back possibly late June, early July, and do a full-scale pilot where we're doing the entire technology from start to finish. And we want to do that on a dairy farm and a swine farm. We will require funding for that, but I, I talked to a few folks, and I think I have a few commitments. Um, so, but until I get a full uh, proposal, I won't know exactly how much we're going to need for that. So that brings me to another company that wants to do a pilot in the area called ATD Waste Systems out of Canada and Fournier Industries who are out of Canada. Fournier is the one that have developed the dewatering equipment, um, and it's a fairly um, cheap pilot. However, with this quick wash, we might be using the same technology, so I don't see a point in doubling up. Um, once I know more about what, how we're going to be um, approaching quick wash, we may decide this one may not be worth the effort um, if we're going to be demoing the exact same equipment. So what I understand from ATD is they're just looking at this dewatering process um, which would remove 60 to 70 percent of the phosphorus in the manure and then operating costs are about six tenths of a penny per gallon and the press is about four hundred thousand dollars so there's a chance we could make something like that work all right rolling into yet another one that we're looking at doing a pilot with um, trident processes and I've spoke about uh, this technology before we had them come out to an Ag Solutions meeting it is used at Fair Oaks Dairy in Indiana which is the largest dairy in the United States um, they're using their technology there to remove um, the phosphorus from the manure and about at about 80 percent efficiency and they're working on trials to get that more efficient and actually look at remo removing some of the nitrogen as well so what they want to do is come here after they're finished um, refining the technology and do a long-term pilot. So they would be here for several months and we would be able to process all the manure from at least two swine facilities and two dairy facilities. So we're talking millions of gallons of manure that would be processed with this pilot. So I'm looking at a grant with Ohio Water Development Authority that um, would help fund this project it does require a 50 percent match um, what they're telling me right now is to do this full-scale pilot it'd be about a hundred thousand dollars so that's why we need to bring the grant in on on this case um, here's kind of a schematic of what of what their process is it's very similar they're using a dissolved air flotation device to get the solids off they're skimming them off and then they're pressing them out even further to get more water out um, Time frame is going to depend on the grant and the weather. Most likely it wouldn't be till next spring at the earliest when we would look at that pilot. I also wanted to briefly touch upon a trip that I just took two weeks ago or a week and a half ago down to North Carolina around Raleigh. <coughs> Prestige Farms is similar to Cooper Farms. They're an integrator, but they are the largest turkey integrator in the United States. And they are facing some of the same issues they don't have a lake like we do, but they're having phosphorus build up on the land. They've got too much manure, nowhere to go with it. So they're build it, they built a state-of-the-art $35 million facility that's burning turkey manure. So they're putting turkey manure into these boilers system, and then they're creating steam, which the, you can see the one picture. Um, those lines are coming out of their burning facility and going over to their feed mill and they're using the steam in the feed mill to pelletize feed. And then they have the ability to create electricity as well, and 
they're creating an ash product, which will have a high phosphorus and potassium value that they want to blend with lime or gypsum and sell it as fertilizer. The interesting thing about this is 70% of their funding is coming through renewable energy credits from the government. So right now, Coopers, I went with Coopers and Van Tilburg Farms. They're the largest poultry manure handlers um, in the county. They're looking into a, how could we fund this in Ohio if those same renewable energy credits are available um, as it is in North Carolina. So that's really the only way to make this um, pay off. But Prestige told us that within four to five years, they'll have their investment paid off um, basically with those renewable energy credits. All right, I know I'm going through this fast, but um, I want to switch gears here. Manure composting. I've done, I did an event last August uh, promoting manure composting. It's an excellent practice. It's an old practice. We've got a few farmers in this watershed that are utilizing this practice. It just takes a lot of management and space. But basically what we're doing is we're burning the water off of the manure, which allows us to take that manure further. And you end up with an odor-free product too, which is pretty cool. So if anyone's ever interested in seeing um, a facility that's doing that, um, the one guy's very willing to let people come and take a look at what he's doing. I'd be happy to um, set something up. Um, but I've been asked to look for a grant um, to look to buy a manure compost turner that could be shared between farmers within the county. Um, grants don't like to pay for equipment though, so it's been kind of a challenge, but we'll continue to look because I think it could be beneficial. Um, this was just some pictures of the event we had back in August, and you can see the piles there that this gentleman, it's a, he's a dairy farmer, um, and he actually, you can see that bottom picture, the slop, the sloppy manure that comes out of the dairy free stall, they actually just blow that on top of the piles, and they turn that right back in. So I think he estimates about 75% of his manure is actually composted and then the other 25% just directly land applied. I've talked in the past a lot about pit additives and when Ag Solutions first formed, they got hit up really hard with a lot of companies selling a product that you just dump into a pit and it's supposed to make things happen. Um, I've done trials with Instagro, Manure Master Plus, and then FFT Technologies just since I started. I'm still working on some pilots with Instagro and Manure Master Plus. These products have benefits to farmers. They reduce odor, they reduce flies, they can help with salads build up, um, crusting issues. However, as far as an overall phosphorus reduction, um, there's really no benefit. There are some products that can stratify the manure and make that phosphorus go to the bottom, which if you change your management could be beneficial. You take that bottom sludge further away. Um, however, it's expensive and it's extra cost and um, so it, unless guys are having an issue with odor and crusting and that kind of thing, I haven't really recommended these products. So I'm going to switch gears here to edge of field and field level practices that I'm doing some research on and working on. I just submitted a grant this week to do a project up in the St. Mary's River watershed um, where you can see this picture. There's gully erosion, pretty severe occurring in that waterway. Um, what we want to do in, instead of just building a traditional grass waterway is add some inline, a series of inline conservation practices, wetlands, uh, blind inlets, and then the waterways themselves. So this will be a showpiece um, if it's successful that we can hopefully replicate in Grand Lake St. Mary's and other areas um, of the county. So. That'll be one to watch, and um, if we are successful, we build this in the summer of 2018. Um, I always am promoting soil health, no-till cover crops, so I applied for another grant um, where we would actually purchase a drone to do some evaluation of fields, um, looking at no-till versus conventional till fields, and what kind of differences we can see in compaction along with some actual soil health testing on those fields. And we'll do a field day with that and do a lot of PR. 
Another thing I'm working on is saturated buffer research. Wright State University uh, Lake Campus, Dr. Stephen Jackman and their Ag um, Department coordinator, Greg McGlinch, and several students are working um, to do some research on the saturated buffer. It's the only one in the state of Ohio, and it's here in Mercer County in the Lake Erie watershed. This practice has been extensively researched in Iowa. However, it's, our soils are quite different in Ohio, so it'll be interesting to see how this works in Ohio. But basically what we're doing is we're diverting a portion of that tile water into a tile that runs shallowly alongside of a, a grass buffer, or in this case, a riparian buffer. And the goal is to get that riparian buffer to take up nutrients instead of discharging that directly to the ditch. So we'll be doing this over the next two years. We want to start as soon as possible since we're getting in um, to the growing season. Tile bioreactors. This is another practice to remove phosphorus and nitrogen from tile water. We had one installed at the seminary farm several years ago. Ohio State got a grant to put this in. However, they've not collected any data off of it yet. And I have been pushing on them to get started and I've offered my assistance any way I can. And I actually did hear from them late yesterday. I'm gonna start collecting samples next week and um, basically storing them till they can come pick them up and have them analyzed. So it'll be great to have some data off of that, um, set, that tile bioreactor that's already installed. So how this works is um, the tile water flows into one chamber, which is wood chips, which removes nitrogen from the water. And then it's flowing into a second chamber with iron slag, which is gonna remove the phosphorus. They say these will last up to 20 years um, before you'd have to go in and remove that media, the wood chips and the iron slag and replace it. But we'll know more once we can collect some data. Um, it was mentioned earlier by Tom, um, we need to look at more monitoring data. So on Chickasaw Creek, we've been collecting data since 2008, and Heidelberg's been um, instrumental in, in analyzing that data. But Heidelberg's always been, they need, you know, they need 30 years before they can develop any trends. So we went to Wright State Lake Campus and said, hey, is there any way you'd be willing to do an analysis of this data if we provide it to you? So finally, we got the data for through the end of 2016, and Dr. Jackman out, out at Wright State is gonna be analyzing this data to look at the trends um, based on a constant flow and see if we've made progress. We're basically benchmarking it off of when we started the distressed watershed rules. So we're going to look at a pre and a post condition. Um, we hope to have that ready to go around mid-May, and we should be able to release some of that um, analysis to the public. It looks positive from what I've seen so far. Also working again with Wright State on doing some habitat monitoring in the feeder creeks. We'd be looking at those list of creeks here, the six major feeders. Um, habitat data was last collected in 1999 and EPA doesn't anticipate to be back until 2022, and I would highly suspect that 2022 may not happen either. So if we can get some data in between there, um, and Wright State can provide that, I think it would be beneficial. Okay, now I'm gonna cover what Jeff was gonna cover here, the nine element non-point source plans that we're working on. I've been working with Jeff on this, but he's taken the lead. And I actually have a copy of, of each plan that we're working on up here if anyone's interested in taking a look. We're working on Beaver Creek and Chickasaw Creek. And the reason we chose these two watersheds to start with is we had some projects we had already been looking at and we thought that we would have the best producer participation in these two watersheds. So EPA came out I think of a year or two ago and said you had to have these plans if you wanted to utilize 319 money in the future. So we decided we would um, write these plans so we would be eligible for the 319 funds. Some of the proposed projects that we're looking at is um, a nutrient incorporation program where we would incentivize the farmer to ensure that his nutrients get placed either below the surface or incorporated within 24 hours. So we want to make sure that we're having the best soil contact that we can get. Um, Heidelberg has done extensive research along with Dr. Libby Dayton um, out of Ohio State and they say a 90% reduction of phosphorus runoff can occur 
if you get that nutrient incorporated or injected. We're also looking at phosphorus reduction. So we've got elevated uh, phosphorus levels in a lot of our fields. How many, I don't know, but we want to start with those um, soil test phosphorus values that are over 200 pounds per acre. We're doing an intensive cropping um, removal. So we would do at least two crops a year where we actually have to harvest all that crop off. Um, and that can be used as feed for cattle. Um, and see how quickly we can bring those phosphorus levels down with that intensive management. And then we want to do that in conjunction with other practices like the saturated buffers, drainage, uh, water management, or blind inlets. <coughs> blind inlets are um, a non-traditional practice, so instead of having a receiver in the field, we would have a blind inlet in the field, which allows us to filter a lot of that sediment and phosphorus out. And then drainage water management, which has always been a challenge in our area, just because we have, we have more slope than you realize, and these really only work um, effectively on flat fields, but we would just have to do it on a smaller scale. So we want to look at doing some more of those in our area as well. And then again, the saturated buffers. I think a lot of good will come from this research that we're doing right now. And if we can get some more of those in, that would be a step in the right direction. Within these plans, we're also lo looking at nutrient removal. Uh, technologies. We want to incentivize that as well. It might be an opportunity to get some funding to uh, buy some of this equipment that I talked about earlier. We want to do stream restoration. Several years ago we looked through the Mercer County Elks golf course doing a, a full-blown restoration of the two creeks that run through there. Um, we'd like to still do those projects and this would be an opportunity for us to do that. So we've included those. Um, it may also include some two-stage dishes where we can't do a full uh, stream restoration. We want to look at stream wetlands and buffers. So we want to put wetlands wherever we can to help uh, uptake nutrients, and we want buffers wherever we can. This would just be a way to incentivize that. And we also want to incentivize composting manure because that's um, a quick, easy, and cheap practice. Um, that we can encourage guys to do, and I think if we can provide some sort of incentive, we can get more guys encouraged to do that. Um, a couple things that aren't up here, we are including the Chickasaw Creek um, treatment train, um, Carthagena sewer project, and then future sewer projects for St. Rose and Casella in these plans as well. So the status of the plans right now is the Beaver Creek has been sent to US EPA for final approval. And then we are awaiting comments from Ohio EPA on Chickasaw Creek. We've been told our plans are on a priority right now just because we don't have. So last year you could um, <coughs> apply for a project for 319 while you were doing the plans. We did not apply for a project, so we're basically not a priority. So we're kind of in a holding pattern right now, um, waiting on comments back on Chickasaw Creek. So if there's any input on, on those plans, something you'd like us to include, there's still time, we can. That's why I wanted to bring it up today or why Jeff was gonna be here um, to bring it up. So any input or ideas on projects that we can include, feel free to contact me or Jeff um, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions that I can answer. Yes, um, President Trump has a proposed budget that eliminates a lot of EPA type funding. How does that affect these projects? Well, it could be it could be a problem. Um, like the one grant I just submitted, I'm a little concerned. It's a Great Lakes um, program. It may the funding may get cut. These plans will still go forward. You know, we've already spent the money and the time to do them, so th those will go forward. But yeah, it could be an issue in funding these future projects. I, we really just don't know. <clears throat> what's going to happen yet unfortunately anything else if not yeah that, uh, that that first company that you had where they had two products they had the solids and then they had the liquid and you, you added something and you said it produced a cake yeah a sulfate yeah so what was that product called again this is the, that's the quick wash technology. So we're adding sulfuric acid to the manure to get that 
phosphorus into solution, separating the solids out, and then we add lime back to the system to cap precipitate that calcium phosphate out. So we're creating a calcium phosphate product. That can be sold as fertilizer. So what I've been told is the properties of that are very similar to triple superphosphate, which is already on the market. It's a, it's a high um, phosphorus fertilizer. We want to ship it out of the watershed. That's the point. Are we selling fertilizer? Yeah. Yeah. Put it on some of these lawns and get back into the... No. The goal is to move it to where it's needed on, on farm fields. So there is 40% of the phosphorus that's land applied in Ohio is mined out of Florida and shipped up to Ohio. So if we can convert that 40% and stop it from coming from the mines and make it from sources that are already being generated in Ohio, that should be a win-win. I mean, if you they're talking about a 40% reduction is what's needed in Lake Erie. There's your 40% reduction right there. If we you already utilize existing phosphorus sources that are in Ohio instead of shipping it from Florida, then right there's your 40%. Bill? I just have a question. Is there anything different they can use besides phosphorus? I mean, I don't know that much about farming, but it certainly seems rather odd that they're pouring stuff on the field or are spending millions of dollars to take back out and it's poisoning the lake. So well, you, know I mean? you have to have phosphorus to get crops to grow. It's just that in our watershed, we've got a historical problem where we've overapplied it. Farmers were not educated back in the 80s. They were told that they needed commercial fertilizer on top of their manure because that's all we knew. Um, they were listening to their crop advisors and honestly, no one really realized that there was the value in manure that we know now there is a value. And we're left with this issue of, of soil phosphorus buildup um, and that's why we need to try to separate some of this out and get it shipped to where they do still need phosphorus in their soil to grow good crops because i would say the majority of the acres in ohio still need phosphorus added to their soil to grow the crops that they want to grow is this information available online um I've got a little, a couple blurbs on, on my website. Um, I have a Facebook page, um, but I'd be happy to share anything with you. But these, like these removal technologies, they all have their own websites. You can check all of them out individually. Um, they have great videos and um, different things online. So, but if I tell people about this plan, I live at Bass Landing. Mm -hmm. You know, how will I refer them to something that they can? You know, where could we get some contact information? Yeah, I've, I've got plenty of cards up here. You, you know, you feel free to contact me or the local soil and water office. Okay. Um, you know, Tracy, I can is, is this something we could share on the web? Our yeah, website? yeah, so sure. Okay. Okay. Sure. sure. And everybody in the make it make it, Absolutely. Make it available to people through our website. Absolutely. Yes. In the, um, the article about Scott's, didn't they say they were taking the phosphorus out of their uh, fertilizer? Yes, they have. They yeah. have so. all their lawn fertilizers are phosphorus free so unless you're good. looking at starting a new lawn. That's the only pro one of their products that carries phosphorus. Because okay. typically your lawns, you know, they don't need phosphorus. They really only need nitrogen to green up and grow okay. successfully. Now, other crops, field crops, on the other hand, are a different story. I mean, they've got to have that a, a, a certain amount of phosphorus there. And there are plenty of recommendations out there. It's called the Tri-State Fertilizer Guide on what farmers should be following on their nutrient applications. And we encourage that, and that's what we follow whenever we write a plan, or I should say the soil and water writes a plan, a uh, nutrient management plan for a farm. Yeah, what proportion of the acreage out here has this legacy phosphorus problem? I really can't quantify that. I don't know. Um, the soil and water might have a better idea because they're they're seeing a lot more of the soil tests come through, but I don't see any of the producer's soil tests, so I really don't know. But our goal is, you know, to start with maybe 5% of the acres in each of those watersheds to do this reduction. So I'm going to assume at least 5% in each of those um, two watersheds, the Beaver Creek and the Chickasaw, are going to be over that 200 pounds per acre. And agronomic levels are somewhere around 
80 to 100 is where you should be to grow good crops. So if we can get those down and we can show how quickly we can move them down by doing a cr double cropping, that's what we're after. So will you have to ship the crop out of the area? It, it, it depends. Yeah, some of them are going to have to. They're going to have to sell it to you know, someone who could use it to feed it to cattle. Um, back to what can you do, and it was mentioned, when you buy your fertilizer, look for the kind that says 2305. The zero means it has no phosphorus. And I, a couple years ago, I went in all the major places you can buy fertilizer, and, and they have the zero in, in the middle. They have it. And you can you know, uh, buy it. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's getting harder, like you said. I think at Menards, the last time I looked, the only one that's got uh, phosphorus in it is, like you said, for starter. Yep. And it says for starter, you know, on zone. Yep. The other is in conjunction with soil and water, uh, we sponsor uh, soil phosphor, soil tests for your lawns. And we pay two thirds of the cost between right. us. <clears throat> and so you can get your soil sample in your yard and it'll tell you, if you what you need. And besides that, there's, uh, like I had mine done and they said I needed to add a little sulfur, you know, with no phosphorus <laughs> needed. So there's just a couple things, you know, uh, that you can do as a property owner around the lake and encourage your neighbors to do it. If you see them <laughs> spreading the fertilizer and you happen to see it's got phosphorus in it, you just might tell them, you know, you're not helping the lake. <laughs> yeah, we've been doing that program. It's a great program for, what is it, Tom, maybe 10 years already? Probably. Um, where we provide that soil test at like $5 um, cost, which is, you know, a 75% discount. And Helena Chemical Company has partnered with the Lake Improvement Association and the Soil and Water to do that. So I encourage you all to take advantage of it. It'll be available again this year. So just stop by the Soil and Water or Helena Chemical Company and um, you can pick up your, your coupon for your soil sample. Is there anything else? Yes? Just one other question. Uh, my wife and I are going on a bus trip here soon to Western Indiana to visit this this uh, large facility where they have uh, 3,000 no. cows. Fair Oaks Dairy? And they, and they have a, a digester. Are you familiar with that's that? Fair, that's Fair Oaks Dairy, yes. I was there back in October um, to see their um, manure facility. That's really all I saw. But yeah, it's a, it's a tourism. They, they promote tourism. They have their own restaurant. Um, it's a pretty unique place. But yeah, that's where this trident processes, um, they use that system. They have it so that all their manure comes in on trucks. So they vacuum all their manure out of their freestall barns and then they put it through a sand separator. So they have a sand lane and a mechanical sand separator, reclaim the sand. They put it in the manure into an anaerobic digester, let it digest. They pull the liquid out, they put it through this trident processes, which is a, a dissolved air flotation device. They skim the solids off the top, and then they press the water out of that even further. And the unique thing there is they, um, a company called Midwestern Bioag just invested $10 million to create a fertilizer facility where they're taking all of that cake material, that phosphorus rich material coming out of the manure, and um, blending it with other materials and then pelletizing and bagging it. Um, so it's really unique facility, and um, it'll be an interesting tour for you. Yeah, they said they were producing all the energy they needed, electricity and energy yep. to run the whole facility. Yeah, they have a compressed natural gas fueling station, so all their trucks are fueled by compressed natural gas that comes out of their digester. It's a very, it's a very unique facility, but I didn't realize how widespread it was. So they don't have. 15,000 cows in one spot. It's all, they have 3,000 cows in one, and then you go down the road and there's another 3,000. Um, so it's, it's a drive the bus, right? Yeah, you can drive right through and see the parlor. It's, it's pretty cool. Any other, anything else? All right, thank you very much.